This podcast has been brought to you by Seekers Guidance, the global Islamic seminary. Help us spread the light of prophetic guidance to millions around the world by becoming a monthly supporter. Make a small donation at seekersguidance.org forward slash donate. For as little as $10 a month, you can help people find life-changing guidance. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Allahumma la ilma lana illa ma'allamtuna innaka anta al-alim al-hakim. Allahumma alimna ma yanfa'una wa anfa'na bima tu'allimuna wa zidna min fadlika ilman wa amalan wa qurban ya arhamar rahimin. Allahumma zidna wa la tanqusna wa akrimna wa la tuhinna wa a'atina wa la tahrimna wa a'athirna wa la tu'fir alayna. وأرضنا ورضى عنا يا أرحم الراحمين ويا أكرم الأكرمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته أبري رابل الحمد لله رب العالمين So we looked yesterday at Sayyidina Musa عليه الصلاة والسلام leaving Madian going to going towards Egypt and meeting Allah سبحانه وتعالى through this tree so um what we have is um, the the Bible, I believe, refers it refers to it as a bush, right? <clears throat> the burning bush. Um, in Islam, I believe the term shajara is used, and the word shajara can refer to a tree or a bush. So Allahu alam, whatever it was. Um, so. It was on fire, his feet, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala spoke to Sayyidina Musa through it and he gave him the first points of revelation uh, which we talked about at length yesterday from Surah Taha and now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he, he said to him وَأَنَ اخْتَرْتُكَ فَاسْتَمِعْ لِمَا يُوحَى and I've chosen you so uh, listen carefully to what's being conveyed to you, what's being revealed to you so now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will prepare Sayyidina Musa and prepare him in order to receive these miracles and he will also prepare him for his function and role as a messenger so um let's start off i mean a good place to start is by looking at miracles what do we mean by miracles so in arabic it's, it's often referred to referred to as a kharqul ada a break in the normal way of things. So the way of the world is the way things happen in, in the universe is generally uh, if you stick something flammable in a fire, it will burn. Um, you know, when, you, when you're hungry, you eat, you're satiated. When you're thirsty, you drink, you know, your thirst is quenched. That's the normal sort of things. Uh, but these are just means and they don't guarantee the outcome. Why? Because we have situations where uh, like in the Akhirah, people eat and eat and eat and eat, but they won't feel uh, satiated, right? The people of hell, they eat Zakum, from the tree of Zakum. Um, we've seen instances in the dunya, you know, Sayyidina Ibrahim tried slaughtering, slaughtering his son Ismail, it didn't happen, right? The knife just didn't cut. Um, we've seen instances of, <clears throat> um, you know, you see these people, they stick knives in themselves and they, they won't cut. Right, these sorts of things. So um, there's a set system of how things happen, and so Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala, in order to yeah, prove to His creation that this person who is speaking on His behalf is speaking truthfully, Allah Azza wa Jal brings about an alteration of the normal flow of things. Right, that's what is called the al ada, the breaking of norms. Right, and um, it, it can happen in many ways, you know, sometimes it happens in order to humiliate someone. For example, um, uh, someone that was claiming prophecy, Musaylima al-Kadhab, Musaylima the big, big liar. Um, someone said to him that Muhammad, it was a contemporary of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa someone said that the, the Prophet Muhammad uh, on occasion, you know, many times he spat in a well. And because of, of how pure he was and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created him, the, the well water, its taste changed, it became sweet. So you do it. So Musaylim was like, you know, easy peasy. Right? So he spat in it. And what, what ended up happening, it became, you know, salty or it, be, it became bitter, right? You couldn't drink it anymore. So that's a changing of it. It's not something that normally happens, but it was done to humiliate him. 
it's done to honor some of the awliya and you know there are many uh, many many accounts of this imam yusuf al nabahani has got a, a two volume book called jami'u karamat al awliya uh, the companion of the miracles of the awliya and there's many mentioned and you know subhanallah uh, so this is the main the major karamat and then you know, every believer has karamat in their lives you ask allah for something it seems impossible and then lo and behold there it is you know so that is uh, you know but we're talking about the the major events that people see and then it also happens to someone who's claiming to be a prophet i am a prophet allah wants you to do x y and z the person will say and so people naturally it's a big claim to make because they prove it so he'll say okay my proof is and then he'll mention whatever is going on and so that's you know that, that's the, that's the case with that um so with Sayyidina Musa, he was given, you know, a number of miracles, but the main ones are, you know, um, the staff and his hand. So let's see what the ayat say. Right? Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. He said, "Wa tilka bi ya Musa." He said, "What is that in your right hand, O Musa?" Right? He said, "Qala hiya asaya." He said, "It's my staff." Atawakku alayha. I lean on it. And I beat down branches for my sheep. Uh, and waliya, uh, uh, yeah, waliya, and listen to that. So let, let's just quickly read the eye again. So he said, and what is it? And Allah did, and what is in your right hand, O Moses? And he said, it's my staff, right? Uh, I lean on it and I beat down on branches uh, with it for my sheep and I have other uses for it. So what's happening here? Subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to prepare Sayyidina Musa. So one of the things to prepare him was to say, okay, you've got your staff and look at it, pay attention to it. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala clearly knows what the staff is and what it's there for. But in order to, to comfort and, you know, make Sayyidina Musa feel comfortable uh, in this quite unique situation he asked him a question to get Sayyidina Musa to talk and respond and then in response Sayyidina Musa is speaking and he's he's telling him you know, he, asaya. he was asked what is it he said it's my staff and that was sufficient to answer the question and then he said you know uh, right I, I lean on it because when he's walking up hills and with his sheep as a, as a shepherd and you know it, it makes walking easy and he leans on it you know to, to rest his in the body as well and so he gave that detail and he said and so here is uh, dr mustafa khattab translated as uh, and i beat down branches for my sheep imam malik had a slightly different interpretation where he said and I sh it means to shake a branch so all the leaves fall off it and if there's any fruit or anything that's on it to shake it vigorously so it falls off and lands on the ground and thereby making it possible for the the sheep uh, and the goats and whatever to go and eat it right and waliya so this fatah on the lamb doesn't have to be there but it's it's there you know and one of the meanings that could be interpreted from this is that he's enjoying this conversation it's like when you're around someone who you know you look up to you aspire to let alone someone who you literally worship right and you're speaking with them you know, you want to make, extend the conversation and you start talking about this and that. So <clears throat> even the added vowel is doing this. And I have, I have many, many, many other uses for it, right? Clearly Allah SWT knows, but he's doing this, right? In this way. Alayhi salatu wasalam. So Allah SWT put him at ease before, you know, like calmed him as much as possible, you know, in this way before uh, showing him the miracle. And it's interesting that I mean, see, so there's a number of lessons from this. One is that when you're going to give someone some news, you know, um, prepare them. If, if if it's big news, so he said, what's in your hand? So he, so he reminded himself, it's my stuff. I've done this with it. I do this with it. I, I, I can do this with it. So all of these things are reminding him, it's just your stuff. It's nothing else. So, but he's saying, well, you know, but I have other uses for it. So he's, he's, he's prepared mentally for, to know this right so if someone comes you know it's like if you're going to give someone some good news some you know bad news or i say i think you might want to sit down automatically people are like 
you know, it's a, there, there's a mental preparedness as opposed to, you know, you walk in and say, you know, uh, this has happened, you know, this big calamity, it's going to hit people harder. So preparing people, right? And that's, you know, and that's clearly something we can understand from this, you know. Uh, another thing is just, you know, speaking to people, you know, on their level and, you know, engaging with, when you engage with people, you know, <clears throat> talk to people, not at people, if you know what I mean. You know, when, you know, when you're having a conversation with someone, you know, don't just make it about me and my interests and what's happening in my life and whatever. And, yeah, you know, what do you think about my <laughs> issues, you know? Yeah, a conversation is a two-way thing. Do that, put people at ease, ask them questions, hear what they have to say, right? And one of the one of the greatest ways of actually, you know, just honoring someone is using their name, right? Calling, referring to them, addressing them with their name, right? And these are all elements of good character that we can pick up, right? Also, I mean, before we talk about the miracle, there's something that you, you know we we need to you know, we should uh, understand here. Which is that, you know, what's about to happen, you know, that the staff is going to turn into a snake. This is something far from Sayyidina Musa's, you know, mind. We, you know, in modern culture, we, you know, we've grown up with stories and we've grown up with, you know, what, you know cartoons and whatever, where, you know, where, you know, wild things happen, right? People flying, you know, and all sorts of things. But these were not something that's at the forefront of the mind of, you know, the ancient people right so it's you have to you have to expect that there that even the response that Sayyidina Musa gives is a natural normal response for someone in that situation right and he said ukhra, he said so then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him alqiha ya Musa he said throw it O Musa cast it throw it down um, so he did it so then, behold, it became a serpent, slithering. So he said to him, um, take it and don't be afraid. Have no fear. We'll return it to its former state. So let's look at this. So he said, Alqiha ya Musa. So throw it, cast it down, put it on the ground. So that was his, uh, you know, the instruction he was given to throw um, the, the staff down, right? And that's how it, it would change. Now, whilst he's holding it, it stayed in the form of staff. Fa'idha. So when, this is called idha al fujaiya in Arabic. So fa'idha means like suddenly, all of a sudden, it's a staff. He throws it down. All of a sudden, it's become uh, a snake. Fa'idha hiya hayyatun. It's it's a snake. Tas'a, moving incredibly fast. Now, Sayyidina Musa was afraid at this point. He got scared. And it's a natural, normal human fear. Right, which we'll talk about in the in the next ayah we we'll discuss. But this ayah is mentioned he mentioned it with brevity. And they said, Qala khudha, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to him, Khudha, take it. Wala takhaf. Take it and don't be afraid. This, you know, many a time fear comes from our perception of something and not <clears throat> what it actually is. If someone put a glass down in front of you and you know said, you know, um, there's some poison in there, you know. And you have to drink it, right? Or, or someone said, uh, put a glass with some poison and a glass of water, right? And you, you, you're dying of thirst. And you know which one are you going to pick? And there's going to be some natural fear, even though they both may be water. Your perception can generate that fear, right? And this is how this is also like Imam Al Ghazali talks about when it comes to fear. He said a child, you know, a child might see a scorpion that's venomous, for example, and um, a child might go and touch it and not feel no fear. But if he sees the adults reacting with fear, like, oh my God, look what he's doing, look what this, is, you know, it's a scorpion, it's poisonous, then the child will learn that fear, right? But if the adults act like, oh, there's it's nothing to be afraid of, then the child's own fear, which it might gain, will open also fast. So that's how you also learn about the akhirah and fearing the akhirah. And this is what Imam Ghazali says that you know the prophets were afraid of standing before Allah on the day of judgment of you know what was what will happen in the akhirah, right? So this is how we you know we should look at it. So he says, and don't be afraid of it, right? And we look at his fear next. 
And then he says, Sanu'iduha sirataha al-ula will change it into its original state. Now the word sira is very interesting. Sira in some contexts is used for, you know, you use it for the life of someone, the description of the, the depiction of the life of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa for example, right? Or, um, uh, so uh, there's various usages, but sira here and the original Arabic usage for the word sira in the Arabic language, it means a state, according to Imam Raghib al Asfahani, it means your state or the state of something, whether it's its natural state or uh, an acquired state, right? For example, if you know you say Zaid, Zaid is always calm, is he naturally always calm or? Is this a quality he's acquired? Was he someone that had a short temper first and he's gained this quality of being calm? Or has it always been like that? Right? So either way, it, you'd say calmness is his seerah. Right? But uh, So here, the state of the staff is to be a wooden stick. Right? So he said, Sanu'idu ha, will return it to its original state. That's what he said. So let's look at the next eye. So... Um, so we see <clears throat> Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in Surah Al-Qasas He says وَأَلْكِ عَصَاكَ right? And so, فَلَمَّا رَآهَا رَآهَا تَهْتَزُكَ أَنَّهَا جَانٌ وَلَّا مُدْبِرًا وَلَمْ يُعَقِّبْ يَا مُوسَى لَا تَخَفْ إِنِّي لَا يَخَافُ لَدَيَّ الْمُرْسَلُونَ إِلَّا مَنْ ظَلَمَ ثُمَّ بَدَّلَ حُسْنًا بَعْدَ سُوءٍ فَإِنِّي غَفُورٌ رَحِيمٌ So there's a lot happening here. Let's look at this. It says, now throw down your staff. But when he saw it slithering, slithering like a snake, um, he Allah re reassured him. Um, sorry, when he saw it slith slithering like a snake, he ran back. Uh, uh, he, he ran away without looking back. Allah reassured him, oh Moses, do not be afraid. Messengers should have no fear in my presence. Fear is only for those who do wrong. But if they later amend their evil, evil ways, uh, with good, then I am certainly all forgiving, most merciful. So here what's happened is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells Sayyidina Musa not to be afraid. And then there's a discussion which is a side point uh, in, in Arabic because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is um, so it, it could either be that the, the point of who should be afraid wasn't mentioned directly to Sayyidina Musa and it's inserted, that's a, a linguistic possibility. Or it was mentioned, uh, but even then it's it's connected. Don't You don't be afraid. Who should be afraid? Someone that does this, right? Should they always be afraid or is there a way out? Or they can rectify things like this. That's basically what's being said. So let's look at this. So he says, asaka. You know, throw um, throw your stuff. فَلَمَّا رَآهَا So it was implied, this is one of the beauties of the, the Qur'an, where obvious statements, are, uh, unnecessary statements are omitted. So what's implied is he threw his stuff. And when he saw it shaking as though it's a jinn, right? it's one of the... Uh, uh, That's not in this in the translation for some reason. Anyway, so he says, فَلَمَّا رَآهَا تَهْتَزُّ كَأَنَّهَا جَانُّون Right? Um, so what's been happening? So he threw the stuff and then it starts shaking. So maybe it was, um, maybe it was, it was the, the process of transformation. It could change, maybe it could change instantly. Or maybe there was a process where it, it shook or whatever until its form altered. Um, regardless, but it was shaking. And tahtazu, uh, as though it's a jinn. So, I mean, I've personally never seen a jinn, but <laughs> Allah knows what they are and what they look like and their state. And maybe there was this understanding amongst uh, the, the Arabs that jinn have a particular form or they, you know, they're, they're constantly in motion or something. Allah knows best. But He described it like this that, you know, like it's, it's shaking as though it's a jinn. What happened to Sayyidina Musa? Now, walla mudbiran. So, walla, literally, he turned 180 degrees. Mudbiran, uh, showing it is back. So, he turned around and he ran, right? And this is a normal, natural human fear, right? And, you know, if, if you'd never even, if, if this never came across your mind, right? And, and then you, you actually experience this, right? 
like I said, in, in our times, we've been exposed to many types of, you know, um, many types of events that won't happen or can't happen. Like we've just seen them through, you know, media and these sorts of things. But, uh, so it's not going to be as shocking. But to experience this firsthand, it's a fright. And it also shows that, yes, prophets feel emotions. Prophets are human beings. They're the greatest of the human beings, right? But, um, like, spirit doesn't negate humanity. The more connected you are to your, you know, your ruh and, you know, the spiritual, the higher elements of iman, the more it should ground you to being a human being. Because that is the, you know, the fitra, the original state of the human being, is someone who would accept all everything of Islam unhindered, untainted by society and, you know, experiences. And so the Prophet ﷺ was the greatest human being, ﷺ. he is, right? And yet he was very much in touch with his humanity, his emotions, his empathy for people, his kindness, right? His rahmah, shafaqah. This is it. So, uh, so there's a whole spectrum of emotions that we have, and fear is one of them. Fear is, you know, is a blessing because sometimes it can, you know, understanding. Okay, right. Well, if I do this, I can get punished, and I don't want to get punished, so I'm afraid of that punishment, so I won't do it. So, fear can have beneficial uh, elements to it. So he said, "Walla mudbir," and he turned around and he ran. Walam yuqib, he didn't look back. But then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called to him again. He said, Ya Musa, again. And this must have stopped him, right? He said, La takhaf, don't be afraid. Feel no fear, right? Don't be afraid. Inni, and then he said, Why? Once again, uh, like I said yesterday, there's an instruction and then a reason. Inni la yakhafu ladayya al Those who are sent, right? Those who Allah sends as messengers, as prophets. They don't fear in my presence, in Allah's presence, in His special presence, that they're safe in the communal aminin in, a, in another ayah um, on, on the same incident. That, you know, you're one of the people that are safe. You have no need for fear, right, in the communal aminin. So no prophets need fear. But who does, who should fear? So here this, you know, this, this illa, if you study Arabic, it's, uh, it's what they call al istisna al munqati. So it's not directly connected to the context. There's an indirect connection, but not a direct connection. So it's not saying prophets need uh, not fear, except for those who you know. It's not. It's not saying that. Rather, it would be you know who should fear man zalama, those who wrong others. And this is basically the of any sort. If if you wrong someone. Um, on the day of judgment Allah is just right. so if you wrong someone there's the sin of wronging them and then there's their right right. and uh, you'll have to deal with both and you can make a tawbah and Allah accepts tawbah as we talked about yesterday and that might get taken care of but then there's also this person who you've wronged um, what do you do Imam Abdul Wahab al-Sha'arani said do many good deeds and donate the reward to those who you have wronged. So on the day of judgment, because if they don't say I forgive you, then there's compensation due for the harm that you've done. And there it's going to be in the form of good deeds. So send them to him now, right? But better still, stop wronging them. You know, that if you find yourself, uh, you know, if you find yourself wronging someone, then you get yourself out of the, uh, you know, it, you need to stop. Immediately stop, you know, if someone raises it with you, then, you know, brings your attention to it, you're wrong in this person, you stop. If you can't, for whatever reason, get yourself out of that situation. Ask Allah, take practical steps, get yourself out of the situation where you're wronging someone. Because in reality, whoever you've wronged, they'll benefit, right? They'll benefit through, either if they forgive you, Allah will give them more honor and raise their rank and forgive, you know, forgive them. Or they'll be rewarded with good deeds or whatever. Don't someone that's wronging so another shouldn't be seeing it as you know I'm doing them a favor. No, you're not. Right? All you're doing, you're harming yourself. Right? So you don't wrong anyone. Right? And you know, 
So ya ibadi inni haramtu dhulma ala nafsi wa ja'altuhu baynakum muharraman. Allah said, my servants, I've made dhulm haram amongst myself, uh, for myself, and I've made it haram amongst you. So don't wrong each other. So what you do, you stop and you get out of the situation. If this is if you're wronging others, and the same if you're wronging yourself. How do you wrong yourself? Through, you know, um, ma'asi, through sins and, you know, just being comfortable with the flaws and faults that you have and not wanting them to change, not taking any steps ever, right? This is me, right? And, you know, so you have someone, you know, uh, wronging people in the same way for, you know, for a long time when they could have removed that flaw from themselves and actually benefited, you know. So you don't want that. So he said, what does he say? He said, إِلَّا مَنْ ظَلْمَ So he who wrongs, ثُمَّ بَدَّلَ حُسْنًا بَعْدَ سُوءٍ And he changes, you know, into you know, something beautiful after بعد, after a long stretch of bad. Su is that which will make you you know, make, make your face change like uh, disgusting. But even after doing a long stretch of something bad, if he changes to something beautiful, for inni ghafurun rahimun, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said, then I am ghafur. So it means uh, from a word to cover up a sin and protect you from its consequences. And so the meaning is Allah will forgive the, the pattern fa'ul, here indicates he'll forgive anything. Sins stacked all the way up to the sky. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is prepared to forgive them, right? And then Rahim, extremely ever kind, ever merciful. So he, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgives and then he gives gifts on top of it, right? For inni ghafurun Rahim, right? That's how he does it, subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? And, uh, sorry. <laughs> um, so inni ghafurun Rahim. So then, what's uh, so that's the first miracle. So he shows him that you know, throw the staff down and it becomes a snake. This is one of the greatest of miracles, right? Honestly, it's tremendous. It's a fantastic miracle, uh, which you know, can you imagine, you know, something lifeless becoming something living, right? Not only that, it goes, it'll, we'll see later, it'll go and dominate and eat up all the. You know, the fake magic um, snakes. So anyway, um, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said to Sayyidina Musa, وَضْمُمْ يَدَكَ إِلَى جَنَاحِكْ Right? And so, Bamma is to put something together. So, uh, so he said, what's the translation? Let's read what he says. So he said, وَضْمُمْ يَدَكَ إِلَى جَنَاحِكْ تَخْرُجْ بَيْضَاءً مِنْ غَيْرِ سُوءٍ آيَةً أُخْرَى And put your hand under your armpit. And it will come out shining white, uh, unblemished, uh, as another sign. Right. So let's look at this. He says, "Wadmum yadaka ila janahik." So the word "janah" uh, it's related. It's, it's a word for wings, and obviously the wings of a bird are on its side. So metaphorically, the human, the side of a human being is called uh, janah. Right. So it's not literally saying put it under your armpit. He says, "What's look yadaka fi jaybika?" As we'll see in another ayah, jayb it doesn't mean pocket. <laughs> it might mean that in other languages, but in Arabic, your jayb is basically it's the opening of around your collar, right? So if you're wearing a, a, a kameez, a jubba, or something, they start opening there. So he's saying, "Enter your hand into there towards your side." So put it out of sight. Put it inside. It goes to your side. So it's obviously you can't just put it down, it's just uncomfortable. Right? So to make it go further, so it go there. So uh, towards the side, تخرج, when you do that, it will come out. Consequently, it will come out bayda. Min ghayri su. So it'll come out white and bayda extremely white. Right? You know, so it's, it's like shining white. Right? Min ghayri su without any harm, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said. Su, as I said, you know, is something that would disgust you so without any harm. So it's, you know, it's possibly you know, a negation of leprosy, right? And, and other possible illnesses. But leprosy is something, you know, it's, you know, alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. You know, here we had, uh, you know, with, with this, you know, with the coronavirus, and, you know, like, it's been a difficult 
a situation interacting with people, you have to have your mouth covered and all of these things. Leprosy was so much worse, right? You know, uh, someone that contracted it would basically be shunned by society because it was infectious, right? That's why we actually have a hadith where the Prophet said, وسلم, told people to stay a spear's length away from a leper, right? And, uh, you know, the whole social distancing thing. So, uh, um, and, you know, it, it, it transformed the person's skin and sometimes it would go white. Right, so it's negating that. Like, yes, it's changed, but it's not bad. It's not something bad for you, right? So, and you'll come out, and this is a sign, right? And then you just put it in again, I believe, and then it comes out normal. But it would be a sign that you know this is not something someone can do normally, right? It's a break. You know, if you put your hand in <laughs> under your clothes and you bring it out, why isn't it shining white? It's not like that, right? Uh, so it's. It's a sign that was given specifically a miracle, and it's to prove look, this message is true, right? So, so he said, uh, uh, ayat and ukhra, another tremendous sign. So, the word for miracle in the Quran is ayah, right? It's a sign, and a sign points to something beyond itself, it points to. The fact that what these messengers are saying is true and Allah knows it to be true. Ayatun Ukhra. So then what happens? So in another version of this, uh, Allah SWT says in Surah Al-Qasas, Usluk yadaka fi jaybik takhruj bayda'a min ghayri su'in wadmum ilayka janahaka min al-rahbi fadhanika burhanani min rabbika ila fir'awna wa mala'ihi innahum kanu qawman fasiqeen. Now put your hand through the opening of your collar, there, that's a better. Uh, uh, it will come out shining white, unblemished. Uh, uh, and cross your arms tightly uh, to calm your fears. Uh, these are two proofs um, from your Lord to Pharaoh and his chiefs. They have truly been a rebellious people. So what's happening here? So he says, Usluk yadaka fi jaybik, put your hand inside your collar, inwards, into your, uh, into your chest. Uh, and it will come out extremely white without any sort of harm. And then it says, Wadmum ilayka janahak. So, and then he says, and pull in towards yourself, your side. So it could be like this, one arm, or he's saying, cross your arms, and even one arm, right? Uh, he's saying, do that. Mina uh, rahab, because of the fear that you're feel, feeling. And it's clear, you know, his heart must have been beating after seeing the snake and now this, you know, this thing, uh, this, this change to his hand. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave him this instruction, you do this, you'll be all right. And, you know, so the ulama have, to, have talked about this, about, you know, physical contact being a means of reassuring someone or even yourself. <clears throat> and we know that, you know, that there, are, you know, there, there are a couple of therapies and things um that use this and there's many types of therapies and you know, this some like some one type is called somatic experiencing which is basically using the body using the body's normal natural healing methods which people might be out of touch with but you know using them so like if you feel grief allowing yourself to feel that don't bury it because when you bury it it comes back with a vengeance right and so, so with somatic experiencing a lot of it is you know with touch um we also know for example that there, there's something um there are other types of therapies where they just just talk you just talk about about your thing it, it might be uh useful to process what's happened but it doesn't heal right and you know, many of these other approaches they don't heal and now's not the uh anyway we will discuss that here but uh, it, it's you know what it does is something, for example, in in the practice of what they call EFT, emotional freedom technique, there is you're tapping on parts of your body, and when you tap on these parts of your body, what happens? Um, your basically your trauma is stored in the body, right? And it, but it, this is we talk about long term trauma. It's stored in the body and in the subconscious, and when you're tapping on these meridian points, they stimulate you know this energy within you which releases that stored trauma right and, you know it's well documented uh, but in any case 
um, one point in EFT is actually where they say on your side, you tap yourself on your side. But regardless, this, this, you know, what do you do to console someone, right? If you see someone's, you know, upset or sad, you know, it's obviously someone you can have contact with. Then you go, you put your arm around them, you hold them, making them feel safe and secure, right? And so this contact helps, right? Ground the person, bring them back into their body and, you know, feel, you know, secure. So you say, put your arm there. What's the exact wording? Um, so literally pull to yourself, yourself, pull your side to yourself. So put your arms around you. And you know what? What do people do when also when they're afraid? You know, they come in inward, right? And so, so do that um, because of the fear. Rahab, uh, sorry, Rahab and Rahab, as uh, you know, some of the early Muslims uh, trans uh, clarified this word Rahab, right? This this fear. Right, so so then he says, "Fadhanika burhanani." So these two, uh, the staff and the hand, are two burhans. A burhan will say proof, but it comes from the word baraha, where it's like for something to be extremely bright, and so it's an outshining proof, a proof that outshines all other claims and everything contrary to it. It's like you know this is the truth, and everything else is to be ignored right uh, these two are great signs uh, to Fir'aun and his mala so that his his elite so obviously rulers don't go and do it all themselves do they you know um, they appoint people you do this and you do that and you're in charge of this and you're the minister of that so they hold they, they wield a certain degree of power but ultimately it's it's the ruler who has all the power right so it's it's the, the miracles and the signs from Allah to these people. Um, uh, why do they need signs? Because they need. So what you understand is, in the humkanu common fasakin, that they really, really were. Now look how strongly this has been emphasized. There's a nominal sentence. It starts with inna, uh, and then. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala used the word kanu, like one meaning you can, like they've always been, but you can understand it to mean that it's really rooted within them, this quality of fusk, and this rebellion and sin and all, all of these things. So there's that. And then the word qawm, qawm and Imam al Bikai mentions in many places, he says that the word qawm is used to describe people that have strength in a matter or skill. Or if they put their minds to something, they really do it well. Qawman fasiqeen, they really, really. And then he's the fasiqeen, right? The ism fa'il also points to thubut, firmness, strong. Very, in a very powerful, emphatic way, he's really said that they're really, really bad people. Sinners who just don't care, just wrong people and do zulm and, you know, sin left, right and center. It's their practice, this is their normal way of being, right? Very powerful. And so they need to change. So they need a messenger to go to them. And the messenger will say, I have been sent by Allah. He's telling you to change your ways. Stop doing this and be better. So they will say, how do we know you're from Allah? Prove it. فَذَانِكَ بُرْهَانَانِ مِنْ رَبِّكَ Those two, uh, then, are the two proofs from your tremendous loving Lord. And they're sufficient, right? Who will listen, though? Many people, you can you can give them... Uh, it's like when you, you know, even when you're having a little conversation with friends, whatever, you know, you have people, they can't, uh, they can't uh, accept facts. Right, you have a certain type of person that um, they they'll be very straight, moral, right? And good is good, bad is bad, and you know the lines are never blurry. And with some certain people, you know it's blurry. And like if they do something, um, so it's you know like it, it takes a fair person to say, okay, this is right, and I accept it. But what these people like this? No, because if you come, if you have a man, and who's got a staff made out of wood and he throws it on the ground and it becomes a snake the the experts here who are the magicians as we'll see they accept it because they know we know our field that can't be done this isn't normal it's from god but fir'aun and his minions what did they do they didn't accept it so they weren't fair they weren't fair in their 
appraisal of the situation. They weren't fair, like had they been fair, they would have said, well, that can't, be, that's not normal. It's something extra normal. So therefore, you know, he must be speaking the truth. We submit, we accept it, we surrender. Rabbana, you know, uh, we, you know, we submit. Innana amanna faktubna ma'ashahideen. Right. Uh, but uh, they didn't submit to the Lord because they weren't being fair. So, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends the messengers, right, with proofs. Lest anyone say, well, you just sent a person, he says, stop doing this. How do we know it was right or wrong? And then, you know, when they face with the punishment on the day of judgment, you know, they'll say to Allah, well, is it, yakunu ala Allahi hujjatun ba'da rusul. So that there can be no case against Allah after the messengers. After the messengers have been sent, they've done, done the job. No one's got a case against Allah. Anyone that's got the message, understood the message, if you haven't got it, or it's been distorted, warped, twisted, or you haven't understood it, the other might have a discussion on that and saying these people will be forgiven. But if whoever has understood it and they don't want it, then that's on them and they have to answer for it. Right? So this is the type of person that you know that does it. Right. So let's just look uh, at some of the lessons from this lesson uh, that we can see. So firstly Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala comforted Musa, right, as we said. And you know, do that to people when you think that they're going to have a difficult situation, a difficult response. Comfort them, prepare them for it, right? Um, don't just throw it on them. And you know, Sayyidina Musa, he's speaking to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You know, waliya ma'ariba, you know, he's saying, I, I do this with it, I do that. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows. So, who is he speaking to? Allah. And he knew this, he recognized this. So what does he do? He makes the most out of the situation. Now, obviously, I don't mean that <clears throat> every time you come across <clears throat> a scholar, you know, you pound them <laughs> with questions or, you know, um, or, or anything like this. Um, you know, you respect their time, you know. Um, unfortunately, <laughs> I remember I was giving a lesson like this. Same topic on the early lessons. And someone said, have you got any social media things that accounts that we can follow you on? And I said, no. And then I ended up starting a couple. And, you know, you know, alhamdulillah, it's a blessing, right? Um, but when you get questions in the middle of the night, two in the morning, and people demanding answers, <laughs> answer it now. <laughs> and uh, so, it's, you know, if you have good company, benefit from the company. What I'm not saying is go, don't. Um, don't stalk them, <laughs> basically. <laughs> but <clears throat> if you have good friends or you're in a situation, you've turned up to a mosque and there's a talk going on, you you don't have anything to do, sit, listen, right? Benefit. Um, someone sent you, you know, a link to something beneficial and you, if you have time, listen to it. And But it's generally around people as well. If you're around good people, if you're around people that inspire you, right, with, you know, their words and their state, great benefit from it. Right, and so yeah, subhanAllah. And as we also see that the prophets experience a normal range of human emotions, right? And despite this, they have the best responses, they have the best, you know. Um, Rahim, you know, someone said to the Prophet, you know, be fair. And he said, you know, why like if I'm not going to be fair, who will be fair? He's the messenger of Allah. And the man was a munafiq, right? And, you know, you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't accuse the Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, of being unfair, not in your right mind anyway. And so he said, Rahimallahu Akhi Musa, may Allah be merciful to my brother Musa, laqad udiya bi akthara min hadha fa sabar. You know, truly he was uh, harmed and offended with, with worse than this, and he remained patient. So, they have strong feelings and emotions. Sometimes they might actually feel more than what we do. Like, for example, if I went through a situation uh, and, you know, someone else went through a similar situation, I might feel it on a different level. What bothers me might not bother them. What bothers them might not bother me. But, you know, when it comes to pain, the prophets, they have soft hearts because they're meant to care for their ummahs. 
the followers they have. And it's two-way traffic, isn't it? You have, you have a caring heart, it's also a vulnerable heart, which means it can be hurt, right? It's like that. And wrongdoing should be addressed with tawbah and change. So if you're, you know, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put it in the ayah, that if you do wrong, then stop it. Tawbah, oh Allah, forgive me. Right? If it's wrong on yourself only, keep asking forgiveness and stop the sin. And if you fall into it again, tawbah again, you stop it again. If you fall into it again, tawbah again, you stop it again. It's a simple formula. And you become beloved to Allah. Uh, if if you have if you wrong someone else, then you stop that. You get out of the situation, right? An intelligent person wouldn't stay in that situation because you know you're only harming yourself. That muslim they'll benefit. They'll benefit. From no, no one's wrongs are going to get unanswered, right? And they'll benefit. But you, why you don't harm yourself, right? Stop. And it's not just enough to stop. It's change your ways, right? Change your ways. That's the way. Um, so yeah. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil uh, Alameen. And then we have miracles are proofs of the truthfulness of prophets. And only a fair minded person will accept it. And that's why you have many people that are convinced of the truth, but no. Allah says about Fir'aun and Ko that they denied the signs and miracles that came to Musa, whilst their own souls were absolutely certain of them. What can you say about this? So it's just not fair. Right, so Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. So we'll stop it here, inshallah ta'ala, and inshallah we'll continue tomorrow and we'll look at um, what Sayyidina Musa asks uh, from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to help him carry out this mission uh, in, the, in the best way. So we'll see you then, inshallah ta'ala. Wa sallallahu ala Sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. والحمد لله رب العالمين السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته uh, oh, the question. No, I'm not in Toronto. I'm in uh, uh, Dewsbury in England. الحمد لله. Okay. السلام عليكم. Allah bless you all. Thank you for listening. This podcast was brought to you by Seekers Guidance, the global Islamic seminary. Visit SeekersGuidance.org to access reliable Islamic knowledge taught by qualified teachers. We offer a wide range of courses, podcasts, articles, and a world-class answer service. Support us in spreading free, reliable Islamic knowledge to millions around the world by becoming a monthly supporter. Visit SeekersGuidance.org forward slash donate and make a small monthly commitment today. Our beloved Prophet, peace and blessings be upon him, said, Whoever guides someone to goodness will have a similar reward. So don't forget to share this podcast and spread prophetic guidance.